Hey everyone. You know, sometimes I wonder, like, can ancient philosophy really help us navigate our crazy modern lives? Hmm. Interesting question. That's what we're diving into today, Stoicism. We're exploring this idea of how to not just live a good life, but a great life, all thanks to this excerpt from uh, The Highest Good, an introduction to the four Stoic virtues. And what's really cool about this is it lays out this framework for living and it's not about like self-deprivation or anything like that. Yeah, it's definitely not about giving up all your worldly possessions and living on a mountaintop. Right, it's more like a, a philosophy crash course, Stoic style, mm. on how to unlock more happiness and freedom. Love it. Okay, so Stoicism, where do we even begin? Well, the Stoics were all about virtue. They believed that living virtuously was the key to unlocking, as they called it, sum bonum which essentially means the highest good. Summum bonum has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? It does. And it's not just some abstract idea either. The Stoics were very practical. They were all about, you know, putting these virtues into practice in your daily life as the path to, you know, really achieving happiness. It's like their motto was, don't just think about it, be about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so ready to dive into the first virtue. Let's do it, lay it on me. All right, first up, wisdom. Okay, so when we talk about wisdom, we're not just talking about like being the smartest person in the room or knowing a bunch of random trivia. That's right, it's much deeper than that. No. For the Stoics, wisdom really comes down to this. Recognizing the difference between what you can and cannot control. Ooh, that's a big one. And it's so easy to get caught up in trying to control everything. It is, <laughs> but the Stoics would say that's a recipe for frustration and unhappiness. This reminds me of that Epictetus quote, uh, how does it go? Something like, the chief task in life is simply this. To identify in separate matters, so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals, not under my control, and which have to do with the choices I actually control. Yes. And then he goes on to say, where then do I look for good and evil? Not to uncontrollable externals, but within myself to the choices that are my own. Boom. Mic drop. That's some serious wisdom right there. Right. And, you know, it, it makes me think of Viktor Frankl, you know, that quote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. That space is where Stoic wisdom comes to life. It's about, you know, taking what we know and applying it, especially when things get tough. So it's not just about knowing the difference between what you can and can't control. It's about actually using that knowledge to make choices. Exactly. Okay, so let's say, you know, your boss dumps a ton of work on you right before you're supposed to head out on vacation. Oh, I've been there. The worst, right. <laughs> so how do you use that space that Frankel was talking about to choose a wiser response? Well, instead of letting the stress, you know, totally hijack your system, you can take a breath prioritize what absolutely needs to be done before you leave mm. and maybe even delegate some of it. Yeah, that's a much better approach than, you know, frantically trying to do it all yourself and then having a panic attack on the beach. Right. It's about recognizing what you can and can't control in that moment no. and focusing your energy where it matters most. Okay, so that's wisdom. But what about, you know, those everyday frustrations that we all experience, like being stuck in traffic, for example? Yeah, those can be tough. Instead of letting the frustration get to you, Maybe you use that time to listen to, you know, an inspiring podcast. Like this one. Exactly. Yeah. See, you're already a stoic pro. Yeah. But seriously, it's about making choices that keep you moving forward. Which reminds me, we have to talk about the next virtue. Temperance. And this is where people sometimes get the wrong idea about stoicism. Yeah, they think it's all about deprivation. Like giving up everything you enjoy in life. Yeah. But it's really not about that. It's more about balance. Think of Aristotle's golden mean. Oh yeah, the sweet spot, right. Exactly. It's about finding that sweet spot between excess and deficiency. About aligning your actions with what truly matters. Okay, so not deprivation, but dot moderation. Exactly. Got it. It's about, you know, really asking yourself, what do I really need in this moment? Hmm, good question. What does one really need? And maybe more importantly, what can I do without? Right, and I think that's especially relevant today. You know, we're constantly bombarded with messages to do more, have more, be more. But the Stoics remind us that sometimes the path to, you know, real tranquility is about doing less. Doing less, but better. Exactly. It's about saying no to the things that don't align with your values. So you can say yes to what truly matters. Exactly. Which, let's be honest, is a lot easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. But like anything worth doing, it takes practice. So true. And this isn't just about like material things either, right? Absolutely not. Yeah. It applies to how we react to 
you know, everything life throws at us. So finding that inner balance. Yes. And not getting too caught up in the highs and lows, knowing that, you know, this too shall pass. It's about cultivating that, you know, steady inner peace. Okay, I can get behind that. Inner peace is a good look on everyone. But what about when things get really tough, you know? when we need to dig deep and find that dot courage. And this is where that classic image of the brave knight comes to mind. But I'm guessing stoic courage is a bit more nuanced than just, you know, charging into battle. You got it. Stoic courage isn't about, you know, physical strength or fighting prowess. It's about moral courage, having the strength to stand up for what you believe in, even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular, or even when everyone else thinks you're, you know, a little bit crazy. It's like that saying, do the right thing, even when no one is watching. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, that means speaking truth to power, which takes serious guts. Oh, for sure. Think about Thracy, for example. Thracy? Yeah, he openly challenged the Emperor Nero. Oh, wow. Talk about putting everything on the line. Right. I mean, that's, that's some next level courage right there. It's one thing to, like, disagree with your boss, but to stand up to a tyrant like Nero, that's a whole other level. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, it's such a powerful example of moral courage, but it doesn't always have to be these, you know, grand historical gestures. Okay, I'm listening. What about, like, everyday courage? Right. Think about, for instance, the Percy family from the American South. Oh, yeah. I've heard of them. Talk about facing down hardship and injustice. Yeah. Leroy Percy, he took on the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1920s, right? He did. And his son, William Alexander Percy, he adopted his young cousins after their parents died, which, you know, it doesn't sound like this big, huge act of courage, but back then, especially expanding your family in that way, it came with, you know, some social backlash. Oh, I bet. People could be so judgmental. Yeah. And then you have Walker Percy. Who was? He was William Alexander's cousin. And he used his writing to, you know, fight against prejudice and intolerance. So each generation of that family, they kind of lived out stoic courage in their own way. See, you don't have to be a famous philosopher or a historical figure to embody these virtues. It's really about, like you said, those everyday decisions to act according to your values. Yeah. Even when it's difficult. Exactly. And, you know, thinking about more historical figures, I mean, imagine the inner strength it took someone like Marcus Aurelius to try to be a good ruler in a corrupt system. Oh, totally. He was trying to live by these virtues, surrounded by people who, let's be honest, probably didn't even care about them. Exactly. I mean, they would... You know, throw those virtues out the window for, you know, power, personal gain, whatever it took. It's a lot easier to go with the flow, isn't it? Oh, for sure. But the Stoics would say, that's not really living, is it? No, I guess not. <laughs> so when we talk about Stoic courage, we're really talking about that inner battle too, like staying true to yourself, even when it's easier to just give in. Yes. It's about showing up with your best self, no matter what. And sometimes your best is like standing up to an emperor and sometimes it's just, you know, making it through another day. Exactly. We all face our own battles. Okay, so we've covered wisdom, temperance, courage. What's next on our stoic virtue checklist? Well, that brings us to, I'd say, maybe the most important stoic virtue. Look at me. Justice. Justice. Even Marcus Aurelius himself called justice the source of all the other virtues. He did. And you know, it kind of makes sense when you really think about it. Like, yeah. justice is that foundation. It's the bedrock upon which all the other virtues can kind of rest. Okay, I like that. Justice as the foundation. But what does that actually mean, like, practically speaking? Well, it really comes down to this. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that we are all interconnected. That we are, you know, part of something much larger than ourselves. It's like we're not just individuals. We're part of a community, a society, a whole planet. Exactly. And the Stoics even had this concept of like cosmopolitanism which is it's this belief that we are all essentially citizens of the world bound together by our shared humanity i love that and it's so relevant especially today when we're more connected than ever it is you know like what happens in one part of the world affects us all totally so how did the stoics define justice in a practical sense well cicero he was a roman order yeah and he talked about not harming others hmm, makes sense using shared resources responsibly and, you know, working together for the common good. Okay, yeah, that's something I think we can all get behind. It's not about, like, being a saint. It's about recognizing our shared humanity and just, like, treating each other accordingly. Which brings us back to why we're talking about Stoicism in the first place. Right. It's not just some ancient philosophy that's, you know, lost its relevance. Yeah, it's not about togas and scrolls. Exactly. It's about recognizing what you can control your choices 
your actions, and focusing on aligning those with these four virtues. Wisdom, temperance, courage, justice. Exactly. It's like having this internal compass yeah. to, you know, help you navigate the ups and downs of life. And even when the world feels, you know, completely chaotic and unpredictable. Which, let's be honest, is a lot of the time these days. It is. But you still have the power to choose how you respond. You can choose virtue. And in doing so, you find freedom. Exactly. I love that. This has been such a thought-provoking conversation. Like, what if we all, you know, or at least more of us, made a conscious effort to live by these virtues. Now, let's imagine. How would that change our daily interactions, our decision-making, our world? It's a beautiful thing to consider. It's not about being perfect. You know, we're all human. We're all a work in progress. Totally. But every step we take toward, you know, aligning our lives with these virtues, it not only benefits us individually, but it kind of, you know, ripples outwards to those around us. I love that. A ripple effect. So for anyone listening who's feeling inspired to, you know, dive a little deeper into stoicism, what's the best way to do that? Well, the excerpt we've been talking about, the highest good, an introduction to the four stoic virtues. It's a great starting point. And of course, you know, there are countless other books and articles, podcasts, all exploring Stoic philosophy. And don't forget the ancient texts themselves. Yes. Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca. I mean, they might seem a little, I don't know, dense at first. Yeah. But there are some real gems of wisdom in there. It's true. And just remember, it's a journey, not a destination. So keep exploring, keep questioning, and most importantly, just keep striving to live a life of virtue. Beautifully said. Until next time, everyone.
It's no time to be casual. It's time to be on fire. It's time to increase your energy and your drive and your passion to win. See, at some point in time, all of us have seen our destiny. I was six years old, a man by the name of Reverend Ed Graham, a Mount Zion Baptist Church in Miami. I was six years old right before Christmas. My mother was ill. We had no food in the house. And this tall, strapping man around 6'1 came to the door with a food basket in his hand. And he says, hello, is this the Brown family? My mother said, yes. I understand that you have two sons and a daughter. And that you have no food. Yes, I'm from Mount Zion Baptist Church. And around Christmas time, we pass out food baskets to needy family. Take the basket in behalf of the church and have a nice Christmas. And when he walked out, I said, oh, boy, I'd like to be like that man. And I went to his church and I used to watch him speak and tall and powerful and dynamic speaker. Such eloquence. Uh, one of his favorite people was the poet Kipling who wrote, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. A friend of mine, Mildred Singleton, well, she was on a school outing and, and they took her to a hospital and she was in the operating room watching from a distance and she saw someone working or doing eye surgery. She says, that's what I want to do. She's just a teenager and today she's an ophthalmologist. All of us have seen our destiny at some point in time and we decided not to listen. We decided to ignore it and say, no, that's, that's not for me. Life came in and slapped us side the head and we stopped dreaming anymore. The impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experience of life. And that's what causes many of us to give up on our volcano. The experiences and the challenges, the defeats, the disappointments and the failures of life. Then we decide to sell out on our true potential, sell out on living our dreams feeling that we're not good enough, not wanting to make any mistakes, particularly if you're raised with a great deal of criticism. So you've got to be willing. Life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you wish, but you only spend it once. There are only two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. The purpose of our lives is to be happy, Dalai Lama. The more thankful you are, the more you attract things to be thankful for. Hold to your true aspirations, no matter what is going on around you. If you get clear on the what, the how will be taken care of. Jack Canfield Against those who eagerly seek preferment at Rome. If we applied ourselves as busily to our own work as the old men at Rome do to those matters about which they are employed, perhaps we also might accomplish something. I am acquainted with a man older than myself who is now superintendent of corn at Rome and remember the time when he came here on his way back from exile and what he said as he related the events of his former life and how he declared that with respect to the future after his return he would look after nothing else than passing the rest of his life in quiet and tranquility. For how little of life, he said, remains for me. I replied, you will not do it, but as soon as you smell Rome, you will forget all that you have said, and if admission is allowed even into the imperial palace, you will gladly thrust yourself in and thank God. If you find me, Epictetus, he answered, setting even one foot within the palace, think what you please. Well, what then did he do? Before he entered the city, he was met by letters from Caesar, and as soon as he received them, he forgot all, and ever after has added one piece of business to another. I wish that I were now by his side to remind him of what he said when he was passing this way, and to tell him how much better a seer I am than he is. Well then, do I say that man is an animal made for doing nothing? Certainly not. But why are we not active? For example, as to myself, as soon as day comes, in a few words I remind myself of what I must read over to my pupils. Then forthwith I say to myself, But what is it to me how a certain person shall read? The first thing for me is to sleep. 
And indeed, what resemblance is there between what other persons do and what we do? If you observe what they do, you will understand. And what else do they do all day long than make up accounts, inquire among themselves, give and take advice about some small quantity of grain, a bit of land, and such kind of profits? Is it then the same thing to receive a petition and to read in it? I entreat you to permit me to export a small quantity of corn, and one to this effect. I entreat you to learn from Chrysippus what is the administration of the world, and what place in it the rational animal holds. Consider also who you are, and what is the nature of your good and bad. Are these things like the other? Do they require equal care? And is it equally base to neglect these and those? Well then, are we the only persons who are lazy and love sleep? No, but much rather you young men are. For we old men, when we see young men amusing themselves, are eager to play with them. And if I saw you active and zealous, much more should I be eager myself to join you in your serious pursuits. A hundred percent, dude. It's like this thing in the back of your head, okay, maybe this will break them. Maybe this will break them. So we haven't broken each other yet, but I'm sure the day will come. In my mind, a lot of times, man, I'm like, it doesn't mean I quit. I, I don't quit. You know, I may not make it the first time, but I'll come back. I got to call an audible. I can get my head back in the game. I got to I gotta figure this shit out. It doesn't mean you leave. It means you study it more. It means you study it more. And and whenever I fail at something, people always say, man, how do you handle failure, man? I fail a lot, dude. I fail all the time. They go, how do you handle it? What I'm trying to do and this isn't being arrogant, man. I, I, it's being real. Not many people are trying to do. There's not many people that who, can, who can even open their mouth and criticize me when I do fail. Because I'm, I'm trying to do shit, man, that many people aren't trying to do. But I don't look at failure as failure. I look at failure as your first, second, third, fourth, fifth attempt. I look at them as attempts. I don't look at anything as failure. Because when you're willing to try to do something, not trying is failure. That's that's and that's not some after school special shit. But when you're able to go out there, there's there is no failure. It's attempts. Because when you're trying to do something that's bigger than you, whatever you are, whoever you are, if 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 you're paralyzed, you're trying to walk one step and you didn't, you didn't fail, mother. That was your first attempt. If that's your biggest thing, that's how your mindset needs to go into everything. So I don't look at it as failure is a big word like that gets people down. We give so much power to words. I don't. I take the power right away. I didn't feel shit. Hey, come here, brother. Let me talk to you real quick, brother. People don't like that, man. But I'm not going to allow you to go to a place that's going to be hard to get out of. It's going to be hard. If I allow you to gain five more... Realize that mistakes are essential to learning anything. Slow down and realize that. Rule your mind, or it will rule you. He who has renounced all desires and acts only for the welfare of others, without any expectation of reward, is the greatest of all. Bhagavad Gita Effort never goes in vain. Everyone wants to see you succeed, but some will even go out of their way to see you fail. The self is the ultimate truth. Everything else is illusion. Nisargadatta Maharaj A blessed and indestructible being has no trouble himself and brings no trouble upon any other being. So he is free from anger and partiality, for all such things imply weakness. That you want. You can get singing lessons, get a better job, make more money. 